This is Kate Wallachie from the Niles Public Library. I am interviewing Tom Davidson for the Veterans History Project. Tom learned of the Veterans History Project through a poster at the VFW Hall. Um, he is a veteran of the Vietnam War. He was in the Navy. That's all I say. Uh, this interview is taking place on June the 3rd, 2005. So the first thing I usually ask people is um, what what happened when they started out? Were you were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted in November because I was going to get drafted in December. So I didn't want to go in the Army. Yeah. So I could get in the Navy for two years. So I got in the Navy for two years. So what were you doing before that? I was a printer before that. I worked for Hall Printing in the city. And uh, I enlisted, went in the Navy. When I came back, I went back there to work That's good. when I got out. So how old were you when you enlisted? Nineteen. Very young. I was nineteen when I enlisted. They were drafting it. They were drafting at about eighteen years, six months, and uh, like I said, I knew I was going to go in December. I knew I was going to get drafted in December, so I got in in November. So had you finished high school? Yeah, finished high school in '64. Then you were working as a printer. Right. So what do you remember? What happened when you when you started out? In the service room, you were you had training. What well, uh, I enlisted in Glenview, and from Glenview, they took me up to Great Lakes, and they did boot camp up in Great Lakes for I think it was about eight weeks, and then uh, right from boot camp, I got uh, sent to uh, the Roosevelt in Mayport, Florida. It was an aircraft carrier, and I spent the whole two years, well, the whole rest of my time on this on that ship, the whole time I was in. We were the first uh, East Coast carrier to go to Vietnam. We, we sailed all the way around uh, South Africa and back up. Took us about, I think, 30, 30 32 days to get over there. And uh, we got there sometime, I think we left, we left around first end of June in 65 when we stopped in Cuba for some more training before we went and we got over there I think about the end of July of 65 and we left to come back oh no not 65 66 I'm sorry and we left to come back about mid early January of 67 and we came back the same way uh, we, uh, we came back the same way, sailed all the way around the tip of South Africa, crossed the equator four times, two times on the way over, two times on the way back. We stopped in Brazil on the way over, and we stopped in Cape Town, South Africa on the way back. And, uh, Was that interesting? Well, Cape Town, South Africa, we were supposed to get liberty there, and uh, I don't know if you, you probably wouldn't remember, but there used to be a senator from Illinois named Chuck Percy, and uh, he started raising all kinds of hell about South Africa being segregated, and so we didn't get to leave the ship the whole time we were there. We were there for about three or four days, and we never got to leave the ship the whole time we were there. And uh, most of the most of the guys on the ship were pretty upset with them, even the black guys, because the, the uh, it was segregated, like I said, but the, the black people, they were, had buses there at the pier. They were going to take them to the black section of the neighborhood, and they were or the town, and we were going to stay in the white section of the city. And the city had been preparing for us stopping because we were the first American warship that stopped there in years. And the local citizens had spent a lot of money out of their own par pockets, they had parties for us and all that, and they wouldn't let us off the ship. So there was they allowed all the people from the town on the ship to visit if they wanted to. We had a lot of visitors. Some guys snuck off, and you know they they snuck off and they came back on with the visitors the next day. Some got caught, some of them didn't. The guys that didn't had a good time. Even the guys that did had a good time, you know. But uh, and then uh, we came back to the states after that, and then we were in and out of home port for a while. Then we went to the med. And that's when I got out. When we were in the med, I got out and I came home. So when you were trained, what were you trained to do? 
Well, when I was in, my job was I ran supply for uh, V2 division, which is the catapults and the resting gear. That's what shoots the planes and catches them. And at times I worked on the flight deck uh, on the LSO platform, not always, but sometimes. And when I did that, I would stand there with the binoculars and I'd have to uh, spot the planes as they were coming around the land and tell the LSO officer that the pilots had their tail hooks down, their flaps down, and their wheels down. And uh, then I was, a, we, they trained, uh, trained us extensively in firefighting uh, in the flight deck. Is that something to worry about a lot? Oh, fire is your biggest enemy when you're at sea because you got to put it out yourself. That's, they always instill, all the Navy guys, they instill on you that fire is your biggest enemy. So did you ever have a fire you had to put out? No, we had a fire, but it was in a different section of the ship, so I didn't have to put it out. Uh, we were there when the Ariskany caught fire, and they lost, we lost seven or eight guys, I think, in our fire. And then the Ariskany caught on fire when we were there, and they lost quite a few people. And shortly after I got back, uh, the forest all blew up. They almost lost that ship. They lost a lot of guys on that ship. Government's fault, too. Using, they were using old World War II or, or, ordinance that they shouldn't have been using. Uh, and uh, it just was a chain reaction thing. A lot of guys got killed. They almost lost the ship. They had, uh, well, I wasn't on it, but I know the, the, the fire started on the flight deck when, the, when the John McCain was on there. He got out of the plane. Matter of fact, his plane, I think, was the plane that was hit first. And he got out just in time before his plane blew up. And then all these planes were loaded up on the flight deck with these 500-pound bombs. And they, the, the flame, they just started cooking them off, and these things started exploding. And they have a, a repair eight crew. They're the highly trained to fight fires on the flight deck. Well, those guys, about I think almost all of them were killed in about the first two minutes when the planes started blowing up. And then the secondary uh, firefighters, which is what I would have been had I been on that ship, most of them were killed when the planes started blowing up. And they, they almost lost that ship. But like I said, I wasn't on that one. So I had a couple of friends that were, but they got out. They got out okay. So that happened after you got back. Had you been? Were you yeah. still paying a lot of attention? Oh sure. After you got back. I was still in the Navy when that happened. You know that happened. I think in about July of '67, and I got out in November of '67. So, oh yeah, I used to still pay attention. So did you? Uh, did you get to know people that you still keep in touch with? Well, the one fellow that just walked in. Uh, he just he just now walked in. He him and I were went to high school together. And we were on the same ship in the Navy. What school did you go to? Maine East. And we were on the same ship in the Navy. We went all through Nam together. And there's another fellow that uh, I lost touch with for many, many years. And about three years ago, I found him on the internet. And we also went to high school together. We went to boot camp together. He was in a different company, but we went to boot camp together. And we were on the same ship. Uh, we were on the same ship all through the whole time. We were together the whole time. And I still keep uh, very much in contact with him. Was that unusual to, to know other people before? Yeah. It, you know, as far as, as far as I was concerned, yeah, you know, it, uh, there were a couple other people that I had met on my ship. There was another guy that I haven't seen in years. Every once in a while I hear of him. Uh, we grew up together. He was right from this area. And he went in about a year before I did. And we were on the same ship together. And uh, I'd see him occasionally. I mean, we, we were friends, but we weren't real, real good friends. But we were friends, and I'd see him occasionally. And uh, uh, he lives out of town now. Once in a while here, I know every once in a while I see his real good friend, and he tells me how he's doing. So, And uh, there was another kid I ran in, another guy I ran into that he was from, graduated from Maine East about a year or two before I did, but I knew his younger brother. And that, that was about it. I mean, you don't. You know, you don't run across the guys that you know. A lot of times you might see guys that, you know, they used to have like a buddy system. You could enlist on the buddy system. That meant that you went to boot camp together with your buddies. But usually after that, you all got busted up and went different ways. But uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of unusual that you'd run into guys. So what was it like living on a ship? Do you remember anything? Well, oh, sure. It was, you know, it wasn't a, 
it wasn't a bad life. It took a little bit getting used to. Uh, after you got used to it, it was it wasn't too bad. You know, you you slept in racks. They called them racks, and you had like six foot ceilings, and the racks were three high, so you had three people, and you had just little lockers that you had all your clothes in. But it wasn't really, you know, we ate good. We had a lot easier. Well, we had a. Uh, not near as bad as the guys that were on the ground over there getting shot at all, all the time and uh, you know not having half the time a decent meal and all that you know I always had a, I always had a decent meal you know, we worked hard at times but we always had a decent meal so you know I'm, I'm glad I was in the Navy rather than the you know Army or the Marines. So did you have when you were going when you were traveling did you have different duties than when you were when we when, when, well, when you were in port, naturally, you weren't, you know, you didn't fly planes, of course. And uh, then they used to pull maintenance. You know, they do all the maintenance on the catapults and the resting gear that they had to do. So, you know, then, then I was pretty busy with the supply stuff because they'd need parts and they'd have to get them the, the parts. Uh, when you're out at sea, you know, you had... Uh, when they were flying, unless they needed a part, I mean, you did different things, but uh, not really all that much, you know. It, it was pretty much get the parts for them, make sure they're ordered, get what they need, they tell you. And uh, then, like I said, I would get bored sometimes, so they let me go up on that LSO platform and work, you know, work there. And so what did you do, what did you do in your free time then? When you're in the flight deck cruise, you don't have any free time. When you're, when, time. when you were, when we were, uh, in Vietnam, we would fly 12 hours a day, pull maintenance. They'd pull maintenance about six hours a day, and then you get about six hours a day to sleep uh, every other day. Uh, when one day, one day, we had two catapults. One day, one crew had to sleep right on their station, and the other guys got to go to their rack. The other day, and then you switched there was a plane hooked up at all times. So you didn't have a you didn't have a whole lot of free time. It wasn't like I got it wasn't like uh, you see in the movies where some guys did they got to go to the movies every day because they had a movie on the ship and all that, but the flight deck crews didn't didn't get to do that. You just worked all the time. Well you worked most of the time. You worked pretty hard, you know. The flight deck crews didn't get a chance. I mean if you speak with this other fellow that came in that Earl he was a plane captain, and he he'll probably tell you the same thing. You didn't you didn't have when you were out to sea. You didn't have a whole lot of free time. You had some, but you didn't have a whole lot of free time. And then if you did, you know, you'd go visit your you'd go visit your buddies, you know, and, and all that, you know. If uh, you cheap and cheap for big stuff, not little stuff. You know, you'd, and you'd go around the different spots in the division and visit your buddies and all that, you know, so. So did you travel or did you stay in one place? Mostly? Did, you, did, you, did you travel any place in particular on the ship or did well, you? Oh, you? Well, oh yeah, I'd go up all over the ship. Oh, <laughs> was the ship moving anywhere? Oh, sure. Or, when I was in, from the time I was around? in, I got on the ship on January of 1966 and I got off in end of October of 67. And in that amount of time, I was in Cuba twice. I was in the Virgin Islands. I was in Brazil. I was in uh, Japan. I was in Hong Kong. I was in the Philippines. I was in South Africa. I was in Spain. I was in Italy. I was in Sicily. And that's about all. <laughs> it's not so, enough. So, and, that, and that was, you know, in uh, Puerto Rico. I was in Puerto Rico twice, I think. So, uh, no, you, we traveled. We, we didn't sit still. We traveled. And, uh, you know, it was fun. You got to see a lot of places, you know. Uh, Did you feel any, obviously you enlisted because you, you didn't want to be drafted into the Army. Right. Did you Did you have any feelings about the military or, or war before you went in? Well. And did you change your mind at all? I didn't change my mind much, but, you know, uh, I was no hero, you know, nobody, you had to go, 
every you know at that time it was different than it is now you had to go i knew i had to go and i was in you know i wanted to get the best deal i possibly could have got had they told me that i had to stay in the navy for four years i wouldn't have went i would have went to the yard i would have went and got drafted to do only the two years and taking my chances but it was like i said i was i got lucky i was able to get in the navy for two years so i took it and uh Am I sorry I didn't? No, because if I didn't do that, I would have had, had to go. I had to go anyway. So no, I'm not really sorry I did it. I would have never thought of staying in. Well, maybe I would have thought, but not for very long. You know, I didn't want to stay in. But, uh, you know, just did what you had to do. You know, and most of the guys that are my age were getting older now, but they'll tell you the same thing. You know, they, they went because they knew they had, a, they had a certain amount of time they had to put in, so they went and you got it over with. Get on with your life. And that's what I did. That was that was my reasoning. Do it. Get out. Get it done with. Get on with my life. So were you ever afraid? No. Nothing to be afraid of, or do you just not get afraid? I mean, I might have gotten. I wasn't. I shouldn't say I was never afraid. I was never in fear of my life. Uh, I mean, you. If you weren't a little bit afraid on the flight deck, you're probably lying because there's a lot of bad things can happen up there. You know, but I mean, as far as being afraid for my life from an enemy coming after me, never. It just, they didn't attack carriers, you know. It's very dangerous working on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier, but uh, they didn't attack carriers when you were in Vietnam. It just didn't happen. And you knew it didn't happen. So that way you were pretty sure you were safe. So was I ever afraid of my life for my life? No, never. You know, what can I say? Yeah. Some of my friends that I've talked to, you know, they had it pretty rough. My best friend died from Agent Orange about seven, eight years ago. And he was, uh, he was a Niles cop. And uh, he passed away about eight years ago from me. He was in the Marines. And he, he died from Agent Orange. And my cousin passed away from Agent Orange. Uh, he was in the Air Force. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, I miss those two guys, but. Did you talk when you got home? Did you talk about it to other guys? No. Or? So when did you start talking about it? Well, I'll talk to a certain extent, but then I stop. I don't, you know, it, uh, I know this is an old cliche, but unless you were really there, that doesn't make much of a sense to talk to you too much about it because you'll never understand. It's something, it's something. I mean, these World War II fellows, I mean, they, you can you can talk to them and they understand. And I mean, other other veterans, I mean, I'm not, you know, other veterans understand, but to sit there and sit down and talk to my mother and father about it or anything like that, you know, no, I never talk, you know. We, I went, I'm there, I'm back, I'm glad I'm home, I'll see you later, Mom, I'm going out for a beer, you know, that. So that, did you, when you were, when you were in the service, did you communicate with your family? Did oh, you write yeah. letters? Oh, yeah. Yeah, did I you, did. Did you get them on a regular basis? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got I got regularly, you know, from uh, my mom and dad. My sister occasionally, she would write me. Uh, my older brother, his wife would write me. My older brother never writes anybody. But his wife would write me. My aunts and uncles, you know, I would get, I would get letters. I got... Uh, you know, letters quite regular. I used to get the the Tribune, I think it was. Every day they sent me the Tribune. Wow. I think it was the Tribune. How long did it take for the mail to get It varied. Sometimes you get it very quick. Sometimes we didn't get mail for thirty days. Like when we went when we went when we left until we got to the Philippines when we first got to uh, Vietnam. We didn't get any mail for about three weeks because there was no way to get it for us. But then we got a whole bunch, and the same coming back. We didn't get mail for about three weeks. But uh, while we were there, we would get mail every day or two, every two days or so. We'd get mail. They'd fly it on there. Then we had a regular post office on there. So they, you know, you could buy money orders and everything, just like regular post office. It was a regular post office, and we got mail regular, regularly. I mean, sometimes it take a long time to get there, but we got we got mail pretty good, pretty regular. Couldn't complain about that. I don't know 
how the guys out in the field, how much they got mail. You know, never really talked to them about that, but we did. We got very regular. You know. And, was uh, it good or was it was it bad to get mail? Did it make you think too much of home? Oh, it. You know, it was good to get mail. It's always it's always nice to hear, but. And I was always grateful for the mail, but uh, you know, after your, when you go off with these guys in your division, and you spend 24 hours a day with these guys, seven days a week for months at a time, it becomes your home. And these guys are as close to some of them are as close to you as your brothers and your sisters, if not even closer. And. Uh, after you get back, it takes a while to get used to being actually home again. Not that long. I mean, it didn't take me that long, you know. In a month, month and a half, I was used to it. But, I mean, some of these guys, I mean, some of them I haven't heard, I haven't seen or heard from in oh, almost, well, it's got to be going on 40 years. I was 21 when I got, I wasn't even 20, I was 21 when I got out, got out in 67. And be, well, it's 38 years almost since I got out, and I haven't seen or heard from them. But if I saw or heard from them, I could sit down there and have a perfectly good conversation with them, just like I had, you know. I do hear from, uh, every once in a while I hear from a couple of them, you know. I'll run across a couple of them on the internet and I'll keep in touch with them. Do you ever have, do you ever go to reunions or? No, I had a chance to go to a reunion once, and you know, my kids were young, they needed the money, so, you know, I didn't go. And in a way, I'm sorry I didn't go. Would you do it now if you yeah. had the chance? Yeah, I think my wife would make me go this time. <laughs> you know, she would. She, the biggest, one of the biggest regrets I have, I can't remember the year, but they had a big welcome home parade for uh, all the Vietnam veterans downtown. It was, lasted for about two or three weeks, or about two or three days, rather. I can't remember when it was. It was in the 80s. And I owned my own company then, and I didn't take the day off and go to it. And I really regret it. I wish I would have went. I really, really, really wish I would have went. But Having been in Vietnam, you know, the guys who I talked to who were in World War II, they talk about coming home and feeling, you know, people didn't know what they'd been through, but they, they yeah. appreciated them. Did you feel, did you feel like the, it was different because you were in Vietnam? Did you feel like people well, treated you differently because you'd been in the Navy? No, but... I didn't see any of the prejudices from it, but there were. I mean, a lot of people. I can tell you, friends of mine. You know, they they come back from Vietnam. They would these guys would get on a plane, come back. They'd be in a war zone, and then 12 hours later, they're getting off the they're getting off the plane in San Francisco, getting discharged. They're riding out on the bus, and there's people out there calling baby killers and all that stuff like that. Now, you know that uh, some of them didn't exactly appreciate it, you know, which I don't blame them. You know, I, I wasn't subjected to that, but I know there was, like in, in a lot of your veterans, some of your veterans organizations, there was prejudice against the Vietnam guys. They didn't want them because you guys lost the war and all that, which really wasn't true, but uh, there was a lot of prejudice against them. And that's one of the reasons that there is not a real, real whole lot of Vietnam guys that joined like VFW and uh, American Legion, because they felt that prejudice. They didn't, you know, now, of course, it's all gone. Well, now, you know, the Vietnam guys are the old guys. You know, we're getting, we're getting older. You know, like I said, I wasn't even 21 when I got back from Vietnam. My kids can't even fathom this. I tell them about that. And, uh, you know, my son, I got a 23-year-old son. I told him when I was your age, I had been in the Navy, been in the war, and been back for two years when I was 20, by the time I was 23. I was out for two years. And you, you know, and he, you know, he can't even phantom that, you know, but, uh, yeah, what can I say? Was there anything particularly memorable that, anything that, any stories that you really like to tell? Anything you? Oh, uh, I don't know. Going across the equator was an experience because they have a big initiation, you know, thing. That's a good experience. That was fun. It broke the monotony. Uh, what did you do? Oh, they, they, they send you through this whole thing. Everybody's, they got polywag and shell back. If you're, until you go over the equator the first time you're a polywag. And then when they go, they got this initiation where everybody has to 
wear their clothes backwards and they crawl through a bunch of garbage and they hit you with hoses and they got a big guy with the biggest belly with graphite grease and he rubs your head in it and they hold <laughs> Gee, you down. Gee, it sounds like so much fun. And it was, you know, it broke the monotony. It was kind of fun. It really, it really was. And uh, other than that, other than making some, you know, really good friends, you know, like I said, even though I haven't seen them or kept up with them, it doesn't mean that they still wouldn't be, that I wouldn't do almost anything for them if they called, you know. But uh, that was, you know, that was about it, you know. And like I said, I'd like to tell you, you know, I went to all those places and my mother said, didn't you go sightseeing? Didn't you take pictures? I said, no, Ma. I got off the ship. We went to the bar. We sat there and we drank. When Liberty was up, we went back home. And that's, that's what we did, you know. And uh, no, I, I did go to Tokyo when I was in Japan. Though. I got to say, I did, I did make it to Tokyo. And I did a little sightseeing in Hong Kong, but the rest of it, no, I didn't. So what did you see? In Tokyo? Yeah. Well, I went down to Genza. That's the uh, main street in, like, downtown Tokyo. It's like State Street. And uh, it was very modern because to that had all been bombed out during World War II. And when I was there, it was only like 20 years later. So that was very, very modern, you know. And then in, uh, when I went to Hong Kong, we saw these tiger bomb gardens. They were like, uh, I took a tour. Of, they took us all over and they took us to this floating restaurant where we had dinner. And then we went to these tiger bomb gardens, which was a torture chamber, a torture garden for the old uh, Chinese, you know, years, centuries ago and stuff like that. And other than that, that was, that was about it. So had you ever been any place before you went? Had you ever been any place? No, I was too young. Of oh yeah, you know, I went with my parents. I was in California, I was Arizona, you know, and uh, ever been to a foreign country? No, no. So was it different? Did you did you expect the countries to look the way they did? Well, most of the people, uh, most of the people that a lot of them live in a lot of poverty, especially like in the in the Philippines, uh, they don't have it near as near as well as you have it here. Uh, so was that shocking to you? Maybe the first time I saw it a little bit after that, I mean, you just, you get immune to a lot of things really quick, you know. So maybe, you know, maybe the first first couple times you saw it, you know, oh, gee, after that, you know, hey, that's just, that's the way they live, you know, what can you do? Uh, so it wasn't a horrible shock to me after maybe the first couple of times. And even the first couple of times, it wasn't like a, that big of a shock, but I mean, it was different. You knew it was different. And felt sorry for the people, but it wasn't, you know. Did you ever do anything? Ever buy people food or give people No, money? because most of them were beggars anyway. You know. I can't remember. Probably I did, but you know, it, it doesn't, you know, I was no big philanthropist. You know, they're handing out 20s, you know. But, uh, Probably gave them some things, but you know, I don't, I don't remember. So when you were on the ship, did you meet people from other parts of the country? Did oh, you? sure, all over the country. Anybody interesting? Anything, anything you remember? Well, I mean, you had a lot of, you had different personalities. You know, you had guys from the south that, it's the first time they ever, I swear the first time they ever had a pair of shoes on when they came to the Navy, you know. And they were good, they could make uh, moonshine, so we'd have a little something to drink, you know, every now and then, and then, You'd have a full range of people. You'd have very, very intelligent people, and you'd have some guys that were dumb as a box of rocks, you know. But uh, but you all and everybody got along, you know, pretty much. And uh, you know, they meet a lot of interesting people, interesting nice, nice people too. A lot, of, a lot of idiots, but a lot of for the most part, you know, you as you get older, you tend to forget the bad memories, and you tend to remember the good. And uh, it was, uh, you know, 90% good. You, you know, I remember the good, not the bad. I mean, there were bad times, but there were a lot of good times, too. You, know, you get homesick every once in a while. You know, it, it was pretty good. It, was, it wasn't too bad. But I'm glad I'm out. So, so did you ever join the, join the uh, reserves or anything? No, no. no. I, went, I went to the reserves one time. I could go to meetings if I wanted to. I went one time, and it was, it was not like the fleeing in the fleet navy, and I just couldn't put up with it, and I just never went again. So no, I didn't join. So, I know this sounds a very plebeian question, but what did you wear? When I was in the service, yeah, we wore your uniform. 
Yeah, but was it a good uniform? Was it a bad uniform? Was it scratchy? Was it no. Oh, it was wool. The, the, I hate wool. <laughs> and the blues, the winter uniforms were a wool. The summer uniforms weren't bad. They were all white cotton, you know. And when you're on the ship, you wore dungarees. Those are just jeans, you know, and a, a, like a blue work shirt, you know. And uh, that wasn't bad. But when you had to go in your dress blues, those were all wool. I didn't like wool. Never liked wool in my life. But uh, the whites were... Uh, they were okay. They were mostly cotton. And my ship was home port in Florida, so luckily, you know, most of the time I wore the whites. Because when we were in Nam, it was always hot. So most of the time you wore the whites. So how'd you do laundry? They had a laundry right on the ship. Yeah. So you, or, you know, like a lot of times for your dress, you know, because they would only do the laundry and then if you, you had to iron it yourself. So a lot of times they always had laundry trucks out there when on the piers. You'd take your stuff out there and you'd pay them. And they'd bring them back, and they'd be all starched and pressed and everything like that. you got that. back your own. Oh, yeah. Oh, everything you have has your name on it. Everything you got has got your name and your serial number on it. Everything. It's stenciled on there. So you always get back all your own stuff. So, but, uh, and then, like I said, they had a full laundry on the ship, too. So. You said you, you said you ate well. Did you all eat together? Did you all eat in one place, or did people? Oh, there was, yeah, there were domestic. You all ate in one place, but not necessarily all at the same time, mm -hmm. because there were quite a few guys in there. I mean, the, the chow hall was open, oh, man, I can't even remember. From, when we were in Nam, it was open almost all the time, almost 24 hours a day. But when we weren't, it was like, I think four to six, they had dinner. And they had from like 6.30 to 7.30, I think. 6 to 7.30 was breakfast. And lunch was like from 11 to 1. So everybody ate in that, you know, in that time frame. Uh, but not all, you know. But you always, went to, you always went to eat with one of your buddies or something, you know. And then if you didn't want to eat, you didn't eat, of course. You know, a lot of guys, a lot of times I get care packages from home. And I, don't, I ain't waiting in that line. I'll eat what my mom sent me. What'd she send you? Oh, you send you canned meats, you know. And. And everybody had everybody their... Everybody was waiting for the spam? Yeah. And everybody had their, you know, a lot of places, they had their own little refrigerators, you know, so you had stuff in there. You could, you didn't feel like going down there, you didn't go down there. So you didn't have, they never forced you to eat, you know. If you didn't want to eat, you didn't eat. Very rarely ate breakfast. But, uh, usually ate lunch and ate dinner. Did you not eat breakfast because you weren't hungry or because you weren't awake? Uh, usually because you could sleep in. If you didn't eat breakfast, you got to sleep in, you know, when you could sleep, like when you're in port. If they, if they had breakfast, if you, you know, you had to make muster at 8 o'clock, so you could sleep a lot later if you, didn't go for, if you didn't go for breakfast. So I always used to sleep, you know. I used to be very skinny. When I got back, <laughs> when I got back from Vietnam, I weighed only 118 pounds. I was the same height I am now. You must have been a stick. Yeah, How they used to call me Twig. The they used to call me Twig. <laughs> They called you Twig. Yeah, and I almost got blown over once, but I didn't. But uh, wait, but you didn't. That's a whole story. Well, they, you know, that I was up there and it was real windy, and I opened my jacket and the jacket inflated, and I had to, you know, force the air out with my arms because it was carrying me. But uh, I was very skinny, and I ate like a horse too. I ate a tremendous amount. I was just, it was 100, like I said, 118 pounds when I got back from Vietnam. And I was, when the time I got out, I was about 140 pounds. And, uh, uh, just never stopped. No, I stopped. <laughs> uh, no, it's, you know, but, you know, and that's about my experience in the service. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you got home, you did the same job. Was it any different? Oh, no, not really. It was, always, it was all the same? Did you yeah, ever? all the guys still, were still there, you know, that I were there when I went in. Did you ever go to school? No. I hate school. I hated school, you know, so I never bothered. I never was after I got out. I wouldn't go back now either. I, don't like, I never liked school. So. Well, you know, I always ask this question. Some people answer it and some people don't, but um, did you have a chaplain? Did you have a, did you have, like... We had a chaplain. Did you have, like, services on board? Yeah, we, yeah, we had chaplain. We did had you a, go or did you yeah, No, I went. Like, we had a Catholic chaplain, and they had a Protestant chaplain. I was Catholic. Yeah, I went. I went. I was lucky in my job. I was always able to get away and go to the services on Sunday. Some of the guys that were in my division, they were flying when the services were, and they couldn't. But I always, you know, I always would manage to be able to, to go. 
in, in my specific job, you know. So where did they hold them? All over. They had, you know, different spots on the ship that they would hold. You know, usually the forecastle, that's the most, that's up forward on the ship where the anchors, anchors are, you know. That's where they usually held it, the masses. And I used to, I used to go. I was, you know, religiously I went all the time, you know. I, you know, my dad was, a, my, my father was a very strict Catholic. And we were always brought up, you know, go to church. And I did. Yeah, I really did. And when I was in the Navy, a lot of people say, you really? Yes, I really did. I went. I bet you the two years I was in, you could count on one hand the amount of times I missed. So, no, I, I went. Uh, I was good about it. It's very interesting to see how different people answer that question, so I always ask. Oh, some people won't, yeah. No, I went. I, I, I was in there with a couple of Jewish guys. They had, and they used to go because they'd get to drink wine. So, so, so they went to the Catholic man? No, they went to, they the went to the Jewish. Protestant. They went to oh, the they Jewish. A, they had a Jewish chaplain too, I think. Oh, how great! Because they had Jewish services on there. I don't know if the Protestant guy handled the Jewish services or what, but they used to go at certain times because they'd get to drink wine, so they would go. And Helfer and Kahn, those are their names. Rick Helfer and Gary Kahn, and they used to go to the Jewish services. And uh, but. Uh, you know, like I said, that's about it. I don't know much more to say. You don't have anything else left? Nope. I think I asked everything. Okie doke. I'll go back to work then. Go back and start working. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you.